special thanks to Edward Blank, whose generosity makes this show possible. Hello, and welcome to A Bental Brief, the Jewish Advice Podcast. We've brought 115 years of an advice-giving tradition to the modern era. I'm Gina Green. And I'm Lynn Harris. And Lynn, today is our last episode of season one. I know. Of the Bendel Brief podcast. I can't believe it. I know. I'm kind of having some feelings. <laughs> and also, I think that we have probably one of the best topics and letters we could possibly have for our final episode of the season. It's an epic saga. I have feels not only about this being our last episode of the season, but about this last episode in particular. Because this week... We have a letter that tells an epic tale of Jewish experience, Jewish living, Jewish life from the old world to the new, and literally goes from the Holocaust to now in terms of how the Jewish experience is lived, how we hold on to tradition, how much it means to us. And because we're in sort of a dramatic mood, we thought we'd have not one, but two conversations with two special guests. Here is today's letter, which you should know is longer, longer than our usual letters, and beautifully so. Right. So when we mentioned an epic saga, (laughs) we kind of have an epic letter to go with it. Dear Bentel, in 2019, my daughter, in her late 20s at the time, announced that she had met a non-Jewish guy, raised Catholic in a Catholic country, and was moving in with him. I was stunned. All I said to her was... It's important to make sure you are safe and independent. In the fall, she and her partner FaceTimed with me and my husband to announce, we have decided to start a family, meaning she was pregnant. Again, I was stunned. I asked if the child would be raised Jewish. My daughter said yes. I asked her partner how he feels about raising a Jewish child. He shrugged and replied, I'm okay with it. Because of COVID-19, I didn't get to see my daughter during her pregnancy, but I finally got to see her the day before she delivered a little girl, and I stayed and helped her for a few weeks. She arranged a Simchat Bat over Zoom. My daughter expressed how much she liked the Havdalah ritual because it brings light into darkness and her hope that her daughter would do the same. Shortly after my granddaughter's first birthday, my daughter informed me that this fall she was going to be baptized. I cried. She said it was important to his family, but not to her and her partner and that I just shouldn't think about it. I told her she must always remember where she came from and that the baby comes from there too. I asked her to promise me that the child will not learn catechism and not have a confirmation. She said she couldn't promise that. I asked her to promise me that our granddaughter would become bat mitzvah. She said yes. I asked if our granddaughter would go to religious school and she said she would if they could afford it and if it was convenient. Jewish continuity is so important to me. Growing up, We lit Shabbat candles, went to Hebrew school, took off from public school for the Chagim, packed away our chametz for Pesach. My father had survived Birkenau, but besides one brother and an infant niece who was hidden, lost everyone else in his family. My parents married in their home country, settled in the U.S., divorced after 21 years, and died less than two years apart. Six years after my mother's death, I found out that she was not born Jewish that she had converted to Judaism before coming to the U.S. I found the conversion document in my father's apartment after his death and realized that he had kept it to hold over her head and threatened to expose her religious origin, which would have been a Shanda in their community. I am keenly aware of my status as a second-generation survivor and a first-generation American. I thought that my children understood how important being Jewish is, considering their upbringing. Jewish schools, camps, bar and bat mitzvah, I am stung by my daughter's choices. I expected my children to take their Judaism at least somewhat seriously. Now I am wrestling with how to express to my daughter and her partner what baptizing my granddaughter means to me. I can't help thinking that I have very little extended family because they were murdered for being Jewish. That during the Inquisition, Jews were either forcibly baptized or given the choice to convert or be killed or be expelled. I don't buy into raising a child in multiple faiths and letting the child later decide what's good for them. If I am allowed to continue to have a presence in my granddaughter's life, I know I can give her the Yiddishkeit she probably will not get from her parents. Will that be enough for her to become a knowledgeable Jewish woman who will want to have a Jewish family of her own? I need to get this off my chest and onto the table. The door of a door has never meant more to me than it does now. Signed, 
Heartbroken Bobby. Oh, now you see why we wanted you to hear the whole story, listeners. <laughs> and we know that this isn't a unique story. <laughs> Lots of hidden conversions in Jewish family trees. Lots of interfaith couples and marriages in the United States. Lots of families who have multiple religions who are raising their children in both or all or however many they've got. There's a lot of universality in here. And you can hear the specific pain in Heartbroken Bubby's voice and life through the length of this letter. It's very specific and it's common right. across so many types of Jewish identities and experiences. And, you know, what's interesting is it sounds like Heartbroken Bubby is not being unreasonable in this letter, mm -hmm. right? She is not saying that she doesn't want to be a part of this interfaith family that her daughter is building. She isn't saying that she doesn't respect the religion or faith of her daughter's partner, but she is saying that she is concerned about where Judaism will fit in in their life, in their lives, in this new scenario. She was surprised from the very beginning that <laughs> her daughter was even moving in with this person who isn't Jewish. And so then to find out very soon thereafter, relatively soon thereafter, they're having a baby. And then to find out, oh, the baby's getting baptized. That's a lot of surprise and a lot of shock to a Jewish system, especially for someone whose own Jewish identity is murky now. Mm -hmm. She also has a concern for this granddaughter that's rooted in her own concerns about whether or not she's Jewish once she found out about the conversion of her mother. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot that Heartbroken Bubby is holding when it comes to the fundamental question that she's asking, which is, how do I bring my objection to baptism to my daughter and my son-in-law? Yeah. It's how do I bring my objection to them? And also, regardless, how can I play enough of a role? Can I play? enough of a role in my granddaughter's life. Just to clarify one thing, we did nip and tuck this letter just a bit. There was a moment where Heartbroken Bubba wonders if her own mother wasn't born Jewish. What does that say about her own Judaism? That's what Gina has has correctly referenced here. So, so now we know that she brings a lot of doubt about her own status to the situation, even though various movements have various takes on the matrilineal line of Judaism. Yes. So there is a little bit of identity mm -hmm. questioning here. But there are other things about what baptism means, mm -hmm. right? What has it meant for Jews historically who were either forcibly baptized or given the choice to be baptized, expelled, or killed? I think that when we're talking about what does Heartbroken Bubby need to do to put this on the table and off of her chest, there are a few things that she's going to need to do. One of them is to confront this secrecy and family story that hasn't been brought out into the open, making sure that the daughter knows some of these stories from the old world, right? And like what her parents brought here to the United States, what she brings to their family by being a part of that. We do know that she is opposed to raising children in multiple religions, which is not necessarily the same thing. As mm -hmm. we know, there's lots of data out there, recent data from Pew, in fact, talking about um, interfaith families and intermarriages and how Jews involved in interfaith marriages are often raising their kids Jewish. Like, that's true. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Heartbroken Bubby does have reason, aside from the family history piece, to be concerned about what will be the future outcome of her granddaughter. Will her granddaughter be someone who considers herself Jewish and engaged in ritual, engaged in religious practice in a way that is going to feel meaningful to Bubby? She knows that this is something to be concerned about. And I got to say that even as someone who converted to Judaism and who has parent, you know, I have a mother who was raised Catholic. She no longer is. I have a father who was raised Baptist. And so I sort of grew up around church and, and non-Jewish yeah. traditions. 
even though I have that, I still totally get what she's saying and where the fear comes from and where the anxiety comes from. And it comes from a place not just of being aware of family history and wanting to preserve their Jewish tradition, but also being aware of the present and what that could mean for the future. Also like you, for different reasons in different contexts, I've been exposed to all sorts of rituals that aren't Jewish in my own family, all sorts of daily experiences and observances because uh, my dad converted and his family was Southern Baptist. And for this reason, I like to joke that I was raised with 150 or maybe 135, 25 um, percent religion because I was, you know, I was Jewish and um, never questioned it, never wondered about it, was never confused. I feel comfortable in just about any church. Mm -hmm. I don't feel a visceral discomfort with Christianity writ large and its rituals the way I do with like putting cheese on that. (laughs) Yes. I can see another future where it's not a big deal. Yeah. That's why part of me understands the aversion and wonders if, I don't know, there is a crystal ball in which this baby could grow up with maybe not all, but some of the meaningfulness of the Judaism that's built into her life or or that that she comes by naturally, honestly. Yeah, so a couple things. I feel like Heartbroken Bubby is going to have to do a couple things. Yeah. One, she does need to get this off her chest and put it on the table. We can tell from the letter this is not an ultimatum mm-hmm. for her. Right. She's not thinking that I've got to get this off my chest and onto the table so that I can prevent the baptism and maybe I can, you know, get them. Stop the baptism. Right. Like There could be right? like a, a scene. I would say that there's sort of a two pronged goal here in terms of the conversation with her daughter and son-in-law, mm-hmm. which is one, I just have to tell you, here's our family. Here's the story. Here's the history. Here's the why this particular ritual, this particular act Mm -hmm. really troubles me. And here's why it would mean a lot to me if you didn't do it. (laughs) That is a reasonable thing for a woman who is a first-generation American, second-generation survivor of the Shoah. Like, that's reasonable for her to do. And I think she also has to go into that conversation recognizing that goal number two is very likely not to be achieved. She should begin to think about what is going to be her role. She says she can be the source of Yiddishkeit, right? She says that she can bring ritual and Jewish observance to her granddaughter's life. Think about how she's going to do that. What's going to be the way she brings that into her granddaughter's life? Focus on what she can do and really lean into figuring out over the next 18 years what her role is is going to be in her granddaughter's life. Also, I think it's important for her to think about right-sizing her expectations for her granddaughter. She might not get the granddaughter who wants to send her kids to Jewish day school and Jewish camp and religious school, but she might get a granddaughter who wants to uh, host a Seder and she wants to have a Hanukkah party and she wants to build the sukkah, right? She might get that. And so what is important to her about what the future will be like and thinking about what she can do to bring about the most of that. And after this short break, we're going to be joined by Tema Smith of 18 Doors, who's going to help us dig deeper into some of these squirrely dynamics around interfaith families and all of the joys and the challenges that come with them. I'm Rachel Fishman Federson, publisher and CEO of The Forward. And I'm Jody Rudoran, the Forward's Editor-in-Chief. Together, we're reinventing the nation's oldest and largest Jewish news organization for today's diverse American Jewish communities. We're carrying on a 124-year-old tradition of exposing anti-Semitism, celebrating Jewish books, film, and food, and helping American Jews explore their identities, debate political issues, and connect to their culture. And we're doing those things in new ways that resonate with today's Jews of every type and stripe across generations. But we're a reader-supported nonprofit, and we can't do any of it without you. Please give whatever you can to support this podcast and independent Jewish journalism by going to forward.com slash donate today. To deepen the conversation around Heartbroken Bubby's story, we are delighted to have with us today, Tema Smith, 
a contributor at The Forward and staffer at 18 Doors, formerly interfaithfamily.com. We really feel like Tema can add some context and some depth to what we've been discussing today, and we're delighted to have her here. Hi, Tema. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really excited. Uh, my bubby would be so excited that I'm on the Bintel Brief. <laughs> yes. That's what we're going for. Not his, totally. just not his. So tell us, just briefly, t- Tema, before we launch in, tell us about what you do in about 18 Doors. Yeah, sure. So um, 18 Doors, formerly Interfaith Family, we are the only Jewish organization in North America and probably the world that is laser focused on connecting interfaith families, which is a broad term, not necessarily always the most accurate term, but essentially families where, or couples where one partner is Jewish and one partner comes from a different background is not themselves Jewish, with Jewish opportunities. And so my role inside the organization is I'm the director of professional development. So I work with other Jewish organizations to make sure that they have the skill sets and um, really know uh, the ins and outs of interfaith families. I personally grew up in an interfaith family, in an interfaith interracial family. Um, And so for me, it's personal because there weren't Jewish organizations that were super welcoming to me um, and to my family when I was a kid. So uh, for me, this is just kind of a dream come true to be able to build Jewish community opportunities for people like me. Mm. So as someone who has professional and personal interest in this topic, when you heard the letter, what was your first reaction? What were your first thoughts after hearing Heartbroken Bubby's story? You know, it's one of those things where these issues uh, tap into just so many raw emotions for people. Um, and so when I heard the letter, I was kind of like nodding as 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 you were going through it, saying, OK, I know where this is going. I know where this is going because it's a very common experience and a very common story. And it's a story of, you know, fear of loss. It's also, I think, a story of fear of how to connect with grandchildren. Um, And there's so many sort of family dynamics going on that are then layered with these really big questions of religion and religious identity. Insofar as there are commonalities, I mean, everyone has so many different stories, but yet there are so many common themes, as you were saying. So where those commonalities are, what have you learned and what do you tell people about powerful and helpful ways to talk about these issues in their families. I was raised Jewish in an interfaith family where, um, you know, when religious decisions were made, the decisions were made to not do my father's family's traditions. Um, And so, you know, there's always two sides and some people are sort of pulling in from both and some will choose one over another. So there's always sort of two sides to this and loss feelings of loss somewhere. I can tell Mm. you in my family, my father's mother was very upset that we weren't baptized. (laughs) Um, And that was like really heartbreaking to her. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So I'm going to interrupt you. So grandma was really upset that you were not baptized. What came of that disappointment? How did grandma handle that? Grandma did not handle it well. (laughs) I mean, we also lived in different countries from her. Ah. I'm born and raised here. She lived in New York for part of the time that she was alive while I was alive and then in the Bahamas for part of the time. And here is Toronto. Here is Toronto, correct? I knew it because you said organization. I knew you were north of the border. (laughs) Organization. I have these like words. And then if I'm in the U.S., I come back and people are like, oh, are you American? (laughs) This is what happens. My dual identities include being a dual citizen with one parent with an American accent and one parent with a Canadian accent. So, you know, it just comes and goes. Um, Yes, but I did not really have a relationship with her. Mm. She passed away when I was 10. But at the same time, there was, I know on her end, huge disappointment to find out not only were we not being baptized, uh, but my brother has a Hebrew name. My name is Yiddish. My name comes from my mother's side of the family. Um, And so there was a huge feeling of loss for her there. It's hard because it's emotional and religion and cultural identity is something that we hold very dear. And it's a fraught topic because we're not always good at understanding what's at the root of the emotions that are coming up for us. Right. Let me ask you a hot button question as we approach the end of our time. Would you try to convince your daughter to not have a baptism? Because Heartbroken Bubby says, 
She's got to get this off her chest and onto the table. Hot seat, Tema. What you got? Ooh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Yes, religion and culture as a whole other layer, but ultimately this is about what they're building. And I also think that there's an opportunity here uh, to say, okay, you're doing a baptism. I'm going to be there. Have you considered doing something Jewish to mark this baby's arrival into the world or something like that? And coming with opportunities and ideas for uh, inclusive rituals, things like that. I would be remiss here to not put in a plug. 18 Doors, uh, of course, runs an official referral service where we have a whole list of officiants all over North America who work with interfaith families and want to work with interfaith families and have skill sets in working with interfaith families to navigate these things, whether it's for counseling, whether it's to talk to heartbroken Bubby. There's all sorts of opportunities here to connect. Beautiful. Great. And so heartbroken Bubby, you're still going to hopefully be a significant part of your grandchildren's life and have opportunities to share your culture, even if your daughter and son-in-law choose not to. There's so many opportunities for you to share where you're coming from. But one last note of caution, don't do it in a way that's about pitting it in opposition. I wish your mother had shared this with you because mm. that tends to breed a whole other layer of tension. Um, so, you know, just really be aware of the fact that you have a lot to share and really great opportunity to do it, but not to do it in a conflictual way. And at the expense of your daughter. Yes. As well. Tema, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really a delight to have you on. This was super fun. Happy to come back anytime. This has been so illuminating already, and we're going to illuminate some more. We have another guest coming to join us. Tema brings great expertise around the experience and resonances of interfaith families and histories. And our next guest brings expertise in how to talk about stuff and how to talk about experiences and also desires and wants that are challenging. Sharon Goldsvik, my dear friend, colleague, friend tour. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Sharon is the co-founder and CEO of Uprise, a consultancy that we run together. Now, I would not normally bring my business partner onto this podcast for fear of a conflict of interest, but I happened to mention our question to her, and she had such an interesting and different approach to what we were discussing that I knew I had to share it and her with y'all. I'm super excited. I sometimes joke that I'm the oh shit girl <laughs> because <laughs> clients call me when something causes them to go, oh shit. <laughs> and that might exactly be where Heartbroken Bubby is feeling right now. So, um, yeah. I have a lot of questions. No, 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 no. You're here for answers. <laughs> One of the big things that Gina and I are grappling with in terms of managing tough situations, when do we say, I just need to let you know how I feel. And when are we entitled to ask for something? While you think about that, Sharon, I'm just going to say, like, I feel like we should ask when we feel like we want something. And we might not always get it, but I feel like the answer is always no to the questions we don't ask. And if there is a thing that we want out of a situation... I feel like in many cases, try for it. Yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think in particular, you know, women are really socialized not to ask for what we want and either to just expect that we're going to get it or be disappointed and resentful when we don't. Mm. There's something about asking for it that feels very risky. But I think that in this case, you know, we're talking about a parent-child relationship and I think that things are a little bit different. I think, you know, Lynn, the way that you phrased that question, there's really something to that about what are you really within your rights to ask for. And I think this is super complicated. I mean, you guys both have kids. I don't have kids. So I'm sort of only at this point on the other end of this relationship. And as I was thinking about this, I was thinking actually about when I got married. When we got married, we decided to combine our last names into one. So Goldsvik is a mashup. It's a, a made up last name. Pretty much everybody in our family was cool with that, except Yonatan's parents actually were not that cool with it. And they told us at the time, and in particular, my father-in-law, who is from Argentina, told me that it reminded him of the desaparecidos, the disappeared people in Argentina, who were, a lot of them were Jews, 
whose babies were taken away from them, their names were changed, and they were raised with other families. And it was sort of a, a severing of the family tree and the family lineage that it was a real act of violence, you know, like a real, real act of violence, among many, many other acts of violence that were part of that, you know, military dictatorship. And for him, it was just something about changing our last names. Mm-hmm. And I should say, like, it wasn't because he's a traditionalist. It was something about this that for him and his story and his family history, like, it was just really hard for him. Mm-hmm. It really hurt me when he told us that. It hurt you to know that a decision y'all were making was hurting him? Yeah, like, because to me, this meant something so different. To me, it was like, this is a feminist choice. Mm -hmm. And like, we are creating a new like family together. And it honors both of our families of origin, because it's got piece of my last name, piece of his last name. And I was really hurt by that. I was hurt you know, that he had that totally other interpretation of it. I was really intrigued by what you said about your father-in-law and the resonance that the name change had for him because she also mentions that the particular act of baptism is resonant for her because it triggers an association with forced baptisms and this is not that, but that is the association that she can't shake. So I think there's a parallel there too. All of this is making me think about some of the new things that we know about having really tough conversations with people from the field of deep canvassing. So this is like a really interesting, cool, developing area of research that's about how do you change people's minds in a way that is durable? And there are a few things that led those things to be effective. And this may be the hardest one. The person that they're talking to has to be undecided or at least conflicted for this to work. If her daughter has made up her mind, then there's no point trying to convince her of anything. Mm. If someone has really made up their mind, it's almost impossible to get them to change their mind. You know, there are like some issues that you're never going to convince me about, right? So we don't know how persuadable the daughter is. The fact that it doesn't seem like it's actually the daughter and the daughter's partner that are the driving force behind this, but rather the partner's parents can sort of make her feel like, well, why are they, you know, doing something that the partner's parents want to do? Doesn't my opinion matter just as much as the partner's parents? And shouldn't I at least be then like a counterpoint to that, you know, like a balance of power kind Mm -hmm. of thing. But here's what I think she can learn from deep canvassing. I mean, I really think that there's some good stuff here for her. So the key to deep canvassing, the first one is the person has to be at least somewhat conflicted or undecided, right? The second thing is there's no um, sermonizing. There's no direct request. There's no preaching. The person must not feel like you are trying to persuade them of a particular point of view, particularly at the beginning of the conversation. So what should the framing be knowing the daughter knows her mom is opposed? The thing that she is going to have to communicate is that this is not a conversation about trying to change her daughter's mind or influence her decision. This is a conversation in which she wants to listen and just talk. And the first thing she has to do is actually listen non-judgmentally. She has to ask follow-up questions, and she can't express approval or disappointment with any of the answers to those questions. She has to really just listen with curiosity and interest and openness and make her daughter know in every way that she can, mostly by not talking, leaving space, asking follow-up questions, doing all the things that you do when you're doing active listening. That's the first step. Second step is for her to share her own feeling and experience, but it can't be about the daughter's decision. So what's it about? So it can be about when I think about baptism, here's what comes up for me. Related but not the daughter's decision. You can't end it by saying, and so (laughs) now that I have (laughs) listened to you non-judgmentally and unburdened my heart for you, please do not baptize your child. (laughs) (laughs) What? Wait, wait, wait. But that's what I want her to do. I want her to ask. Well, I don't think it's like wrong morally. I get why it bothers her, but to be telling her daughter that she shouldn't do it, I just don't agree with that. But this isn't about what I think. It's about what she thinks, right? And it's about the relationship between them. I don't think I could ask that question and I 100% get why. And if it is that gut-wrenching to the extent that we got several hundred words, several hundred words, detailing (laughs) the anguish that this is putting 
this woman through. I want to be like, put it all on the table and throw it all at the wall. I mean, how many more metaphors can I get into (laughs) one statement? I think if it's important for her to say it because it's important for her to say it, yeah. then that's really something to consider. Yeah. If, however, it is actually more important for her to preserve or strengthen the relationship with her daughter, she shouldn't say it. I am married to a scientist and he loves non-Newtonian fluids, fluids that don't behave like a normal fluid should, where you mix a bunch of like cornstarch with water. And it does that weird thing where if you like slam really hard against it, it's like solid. It's like slamming your hand into a solid. But if you gradually lower your hand into it, it'll just sink right in. (laughs) Anyway, my point is people are like that sometimes. Like if you come at them really hard and fast, we will put up our walls to keep you Mm. out. If she goes really directly and is just like, lays down the gauntlet, this is what I want. Well, she doesn't have to lay down the gauntlet to communicate that another alternative would be preferable to her. Do you think her daughter doesn't know that though? Do you think her daughter doesn't know that another alternative would be preferable to her? She knows that. Is what she wants to transmit hurt and trauma and fear from the family history to her daughter and have her daughter act accordingly? Or is what she wants just for her daughter to see her? What you're saying is actually really useful whether she wants to make the ask or not. I think it's got to be a two-way street, right? That's the last sort of um, insight from the deep canvassing work is that It's got to be a two-way street of sharing and listening. I mean, from a purely persuasive perspective, I would say that it's probably more persuasive not to make the ask. Because that leaves her daughter to consider it herself. And if she walks away from that conversation being like, you know, man, I really learned something about my mom. Should I be thinking about this differently? It's really different from walking away from the conversation being like, I had to go in there and defend this decision that I already made. And I can't believe my mom made me do that. Making the ask is not persuasive in itself. And it may actually produce the opposite result. It's going to be very, very clear to your daughter what your desired outcome of this is going to be. And I think that you're much more likely to be successful, you know, in the way that you're defining it by letting her think about it herself. And now that we've given all of this great advice, I just want to say one other thing, which is like, you're not the parent. You're the bubby. You're your daughter's parent, but she's an adult. And there are going to be a lot of things that are going to happen through the lifespan of your grandchild that you are not going to get to decide about. I really think for your own peace of mind and for your own heart, you have to figure out a different way to relate to all of this. My Bubby, who I really adored and loved, the last time that I saw her before she passed away when I was in college, I had just dyed a chunk of my hair bright pink. (laughs) And I got off the plane in Miami and Bubby came to pick me up at the airport and she noticed my hair and I said, Bubby, do you like it? And she said, no. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> your, your grandchild's going to do all kinds of things you don't like. Your daughter's going to do all kinds of things you don't like. Right. You kind of have to let go of the illusion of control here. Right. And who knows what the future holds. Like you said, it is her granddaughter, not her daughter. Yeah. She's still going to be Bubby, hopefully, no matter what. These kinds of questions come up a lot that sort of feel or can feel Like you are being guilted on the graves of your dead ancestors into being Jewish in a particular kind of way. Mm. That's a terrible motivation and a really horrible basis for a Jewish identity and a fulfilling and happy life as a Jew. So I think my other piece of advice to you, Bubby, is think beyond the baptism, please. The best thing that she can possibly do is share all of the ways that being Jewish are wonderful and enriching in her life. Right. And make her life more meaningful and interesting and happy and pass along the wisdom and joy of our ancestors and not just their pain and trauma. 
that's the best possible gift that she can give as Bubby. Really, like with a lot of love for, for heartbroken Bubby. I really hope that she is, regardless of what happens, baptism, no baptism, that she can still be thinking about all of those things and putting just as much or more energy into that, that she is clearly in, you know, what is pretty agonizing for her about like this particular moment in her granddaughter's life. And you can still be exactly who she needs you to be, whether or not she's baptized. Totally. Sharon, thank you so much for joining us and offering your insights and also the super cool earrings that no one else can see. I have very much appreciated them. Thanks, Lynn. You know, the fittingness of having such an applicable, relevant conversation in Jewish community and Jewish life and the modern Jewish experience feels like the most apropos way to end the first season of the Jewish Advice podcast. I got to say that bringing in the voices of Tema and Sharon to not only talk about technicalities and the complexities of being in interfaith family and culture and making Jewish meaning with whomever we can make it with, whether it's our Bubby or our mom or our cousin or whomever. And then we talked about how important it is to have those conversations and to bring in all of these challenges and the complexities of modern Jewish life within multi-faith cultures and who we meet and who we love. Like we actually talked about some really big stuff today, but the big stuff is also the small stuff and the small stuff is the big stuff. And our broken Bubby, like a baptism is not a small thing. It's a really, really big thing. I think that it was really fitting that we had this letter, these challenges, these guests at this moment in the life of a Bindle Brief, the podcast. It feels like we did a thing today and um, with this whole season. Nothing to add. Why am I crying? <laughs> I don't know. I'm crying. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> On podcasts, no one can see your streaking mascara. <laughs> that was beautiful. I agree. This podcast is a product of The Forward. Our editor-in-chief is Jody Rudoran, and our CEO and publisher is Rachel fishman Federson. This show is produced by Wonder Media Network, and our producer is Ira Simonson. Our production assistant is Carmen Borga Carrillo. Our executive producer is Ginny Kaplan. Special thanks again to Edward Blank, whose generosity makes this show possible.